I'm George Bittlingmeyer with the School of Business at the University of Kansas, and it's my pleasure to introduce the practitioner panel for our conference on early stage investing. This event is being held at the Kauffman Foundation and is made possible with the Foundation's generous financial support. Uh, the premise of today's event is that it's good to bridge silos. Uh, this is certainly true for, uh, uh, for this first panel. I often say, where does a professor learn about the real world? Well, it's at events like this, uh, where uh, practitioners in the field uh, tell us about uh, the challenges they face, current new developments, and uh, what, it's, uh, what it's like to really uh, to do what we uh, talk about in, uh, with, in the classroom and what we do our research on. Uh, the other way we're going to bridge silos today is by bringing together uh, various disciplines. Um, at first glance, early stage investing would seem to be about finance, but it's really about so much more, about general management skills and really uh, about human behavior. Uh, so it's with that thought in mind that we've brought together not just finance scholars, top finance scholars from all around the country, as well as uh, uh, scholars from other uh, business disciplines uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, recent research and provide some very intriguing uh, insights into what is going on uh, in early stage investing. Uh, certainly the topic of early stage investing is, uh, uh, is, is, is absolutely critical and, uh, and, and the format of um, uh, engaging both practitioners and academics to address a, a, a problem that's obviously very prevalent in the real world is, uh, is we think, the, the, the right way to do it. The Series A crunch is follow-on capital. You're at a stage of a company where you're starting to gain traction. You've got revenue. Things look to be really good, and then all of a sudden you're trying to raise enough so you don't ever have to raise again. Oftentimes you do, but um, but I but I think it is there, and I am not sure if it's completely healthy. But I'll, 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 what we've seen is we call it getting stuck on third base. You know. Um, You've got a man on base, you're trying to get him home, and oftentimes there's a milestone that's right around the corner. You've got a little bit of traction, but now you really got to be having enough growth. We've seen probably too many companies early stage get funded in the angel capital round. I do think it's healthy, healthy that it does vet it out, but I will say that I think there's still a function of geography. People are not getting connected to the right amount of capital quick enough. I think that crunch when it occurs to good companies is not healthy, and I think um, while there, there's a forest fire effect, it does vet out some of the companies. I think it is a real problem, especially in the Midwest. Yeah, I think it's it's real. I don't know that it's significantly different than it used to be. You know, I think it's gotten somewhat tighter, but it's always been hard to raise money. Um, what, one of the things you've seen in the angel capital markets is that the groups have begun to really more aggressively syndicate with each other to try to push up into it somewhat. Mm -hmm. So the the round size is being done by angel groups has increased, and the level of co-investment syndication has increased quite a bit to try to at least pick up the bottom of that Series A crunch. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely gotten tighter there. My opinion generally is I do think that's relatively healthy. Um, you know, you start a lot of companies and then it slowly, you know, you, you thin it out as it goes. Um, in general, my opinion on most of the early stage venture funding is that too many entrepreneurs try to raise money. I'd rather see more entrepreneurs just go try to sell and have the money come later a little bit more organically. Mm -hmm. Right now it feels like a lot of entrepreneurs have been trained to kind of force the issue. And so there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are out really spending all of their time raising capital and not very much time on the business side of it. That's a good point. I mean, I think that um, it, it's sort of a function of a couple of things. I guess the um, valuation is, is, is always uh, an interesting question when you're looking at putting money into these companies. And I think that to the extent that uh, it's gotten more difficult, uh, valuation may be an issue. I mean, we've we've tended to see valuations uh, creep up in people's minds, which mm -hmm. which uh, make it obviously more difficult if you're trying to buy low from an investor's perspective. Um, so I think that 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 plays a role in this in the series a crunch. Um, so am I reading through the lines, are you saying that maybe higher valuations in the angel round create expectations in the follow-on capital that might be unrealistic? Yeah, I would say so, Fred, yeah. Okay. That, uh, well, but even just from the standpoint of uh, 
that round, looking at that round and the economics for yourself in terms mm -hmm. of investing in it, it, it makes it a little more difficult. I mean, it's harder to buy something that you think is overpriced than buying something that, that, that is priced correctly. And I think valuation continues to be sort of a tricky part of the, of, of the marketplace. It's, it's sort of more art than science, and, and we wonder at times how people, some of the, the folks that we see in, in terms of the deals we're looking at, come up with their valuations. And I think that that is an area where um, education or something uh, needs to be pushed out to the entrepreneurial the community to, to help them with that, because it really is a, is a problem. So to put you on the spot a little bit, where have you seen numbers around early stage valuations trending? Ranges, I mean, it, it, five years ago, were you getting seed stage at X and now it's Y, or? Yeah, I, I think that um, it seems like there's sort of rules of thumb that people just sort of come up with, you know, an, an idea is worth a million bucks or it might be worth five million if it's in a different industry. And I just, we've never quite understood those rules of thumb. We always try to sit down and think about, we do, we, do, we do late stage investing too, so the tools that you bring to bear in that, in the public market, we try to bring to the early stage. So building models, looking at market opportunity, DCFs and those things. And it, it just doesn't seem to me that there's a lot of that that happens with a lot of the deals that we're looking at. It's more of a gut thing where people are coming and saying, and I think it's a bit of a function of the overall economy. I mean, as things get better and improve and people feel better about things, it's sort of like real estate. You know, your house is worth a little more. You feel better about things. And so you, you put a higher price on it. And that's a bit of a problem from our perspective. When I think about that is really two crunches that mm -hmm. are a lot different. There's the IT Web 2.0 crunch, which I see as there's plenty of capital in Web 2.0 uh, in IT, big funds, lots of fundraising going on, <coughs> angels, super angels, cost of building a company has come down a lot. So you have more capital, lower cost, less need for capital. What you've seen is this algae bloom of startups. Y Combinator spinning out 50, 100 spin outs a year, and tech stars and all these incubators, you get this you know, overproduction of startups. So mm -hmm. it's a crunch in that it's a healthy ecosystem that's overproducing startups. And so is it healthy? You know, it's hard for me to judge that market. In life sciences, it's a different crunch, which is in life sciences, more than 50% of the individuals and more than 70% of the capital is washed away from Life Sciences VC now. They're 70% smaller than they were five years ago when I did Proteon. And there, the cr and the number of new innovations in healthcare continues to march forward from NIH funding and university stuff. So there, the crunch is actually, you know, a smaller number of startups in a even smaller amount of venture capital creating a crunch. And for me, that feels like bone cutting and not just, you know, trying to deal with an overproduction in a certain market. It feels more systemic, more sustained. Mm -hmm. But I guess they're both ratcheting down <coughs> to a level where returns are reasonable in a sense, right? If you overproduce startups, the Series A crunch is essentially thinning the herd to get a reasonable return. And in life sciences, the 10-year returns have been low, so you're ratcheting down the amount of capital to spread it over only the very best ones. I think Those it's rational, probably healthy. But, but for me, in life sciences, the key to the Series A crunch is for life sciences venture capital investors to get better returns. Then that'll bring money back in. Then that'll alleviate some of it. You know, just briefly to your question about valuations, the data that we track in the HALA report, um, we've seen valuations are pretty consistently for angel rounds. Um, so I'd call this the round before the Series A. Um, it's pretty consistently about two and a half million dollars pre-money valuation, uh, which is, I think, fairly reasonable. I find that to be a little bit on the high side, but it's skewed in California and Massachusetts, obviously, are higher than two and a half million. Uh, so you see, so geographically it matters, but it's not outlandish. I think the Series A valuation pre right now is about four and a half million. So it's not totally out of whack. Great. Those are all great comments. Thank you guys.
I've been talking to a lot of the crowdfunding sites and folks that are trying to start up to facilitate this. I think in the near term, you'll have a lot of people that will essentially do them as hosted private markets. It'll be a lot like an angel group online. Mm -hmm. So things like AngelList and places like this will just offer the functionality of doing deals, um, which probably isn't that big of a difference from where it's at today. I think when sites like the small loan sites like Kiva, for example, if Kiva started to do this, you'd see a lot broader in involvement of people who don't currently do venture investing. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be interesting to see how that goes. But until the regulations come out, it was just unclear to see how, f how loose this market's going to be right now is still an unknown. So we're kind of held back by regulatory I, I think right, right now it's yeah. just cloudy. Um, so it's hard to know whether it's going to be everybody can do this and to what extent it's constrained just because it's you know it's not quite finalized yet my i we you know again we we do some later stage investing too and when you look at the markets and you look at the efficiency of uh, capital markets and you have the most efficient capital market in the world in the public equities market and the way i look at crowdfunding is it's really a, a move to try to institutionalize to create a platform to use the analog of the public equity securities market to bring to early stage investing. I think that's a great thing if it can be pulled off. But uh, like Rob said, there is going to be a regulatory overlay, and I, th there should be, because th the concern that I have is, 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 is if that isn't there, some bad things will start to happen, and that will mess it all up. The regulators will come in and say, this isn't a good thing. But it, it, it is the case that if we can create an efficient market and use technology to create an efficient market and maybe put some rules around it in terms of disclosures and information, this would be a wonderful thing, I think, in terms of capital flowing more efficiently to earlier stage deals. And I've been with some people recently in some of these meetings. In fact, one of them was over here. And there, there are folks that know how to create these markets. In fact, one of them was created not too far from here on the Kansas side, uh, here in, in the Kansas City metropolitan area, BATS. And I, I've challenged some of those people, although they're very busy doing what they do with the public equities markets, to bring some of that thought process that they applied to create that type of a market to an early stage market, as opposed to the database approach, which is an angel list and those kinds of things. And the resources are out there. It's just a matter of, and and this visit, this this cloud of what's going to happen <coughs> regulatorily, even if there's such a word clearing itself up. Great. I I think um, I think crowdfunding is important, and there are a couple of reasons, but there's some real inherent risks to it. It's interesting. This week in the Wall Street Journal, there are two articles that caught my eye. One article talked about the SEC and the ability to uh, have now investment managers be able to have uh, their comments on Twitter. And uh, as, uh, as George said, that I can make you dizzy if you follow me on Twitter. But the ability to be able to have a commentary that may be not viewed as a forward-looking statement and uh, having inference to a stock price, um, you know, the SEC just approved it. But there's some very clear boundaries to it. But I think there's an evolution that's going on through technology and the democratization of information and the av ab ability to make better decisions because that information is more important than ever. In the same week, I also saw another article there's a company called Lendo, and Lendo has a model that is similar to a FICO score in the credit arena that actually takes your social network, the influence, the clout, the number of connections, the relevance of your peers, the authority that those peers have, and the more connections to better peers, the more unlikely are to default on a credit obligation. So if you look at those two things, and you look that we're sitting probably a mile and a half away from the Kansas uh, Board of Trade, which used to be very vibrant, now it's shuttered. I think the technology is evolving fast. I don't think it's the next clear evolution, first step forward. I think it's a side step and an evolution in a different direction, but still forward. But I think the real danger lies in two things. I think it's that if, uh, if people are going to be able to be persuaded by a really cool website and a lot of PR, and they're going to be able to fall in love with a company that is, frankly, in my area of vaporware and very, uh, you know, there's no substance, I think that becomes a real problem and danger to crowdfunding. The other thing is that if it feels so easy, that I could sit here at a stoplight, assuming that I'm not driving, right? No texting while driving. Or sit here while we're sitting here right now, and I could invest $50,000 in my 401k because it's that easy. That's a real problem, too. People need to be able to understand just because it feels good, it's easy and fun, that it's still the ability to lose all your money, especially early stage stuff. And I think those are the two biggest dangers, fraud and convenience without making an investment decision. Great. Nick. So I would say for life sciences companies, you generally like to raise 50 to 100 million from 10 to 30 individuals. 
So it really just doesn't fit. Yep. And then if you start out trying to raise a Series A with 100 crowdfunded investors, I think that'd be a real problem just keeping track of all those folks during the capital cycle. But one thing you know that I think it is a bit of a response to is is that you know certainly in our field there's an enormous amount of of return being made but it's all in the private market. The public doesn't have access to it. So in biotech and medtech the vast majority of the big returns are all private sales. And what goes public generally, not always, but generally, is the stuff that didn't get bought. And so you have this massive private return concentrated in venture and private equity funds when they work, mm -hmm. and the public has no access to that. In the past, Genentech went public early, and pe I know lots of folks, Genentech, Amgen, Biogen, they went public early. As an individual investor, you could get in early and get a 10x on the run of Amgen or Gen Genentech. That's really gone now. That 10x return is all private now. And so there's really no access to the public to that kind of return. And they're left with kind of the dogs that didn't get bought. And so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why the public is soured a bit on equities mm -hmm. is, is that they feel like see these huge return numbers, Facebook stayed private all that time. That was a big run up nobody got access to. In life sciences, I love convertible notes. We've used convertible notes, essentially that format, in all of our deals. Mm -hmm. And it works really well in life sciences. And Mark Mendel from Rivervest Ventures is here, and he introduced me to that topic. And, and that was a really good bit of advice I got from an investor early in Proteon's life cycle. Uh, because in life sciences, you have relatively flat valuations, you know, a dollar a share, a dollar five, a dollar ten. And then you get a phase two clinical data result, and it's ten dollars a share. So convertible notes work because there's not a lot of early value creation. So a modest discount and a modest dividend still feels like the angel investor. It's protecting the angel investor by getting them into the Series A class of stock with a little benefit, protecting them against what commonly happens in life sciences is a founder overpriced common stock valuation that at the Series A gets a huge haircut. Now that's, again, different with IT. In IT, you can get this really big early increase. So I find IT investors don't like convertible notes and savvy life science investors do. And it's because of when the value creation occurs and what risks there are in being in overpriced common. If the alternative is a ridiculously overpriced common round, then a convertible note is good. Um, but in general, I hate convertible notes, and I'm not doing biotech deals uh, right. uh, generally. Uh, so when you do convertible notes, I just view them as lazy. You just didn't go through the work to actually value the firm um, because you didn't want to get into an argument with the entrepreneur or something like this. Uh, it, you know, a 20% discount <coughs> off of a, the first two-year run in a software company is a joke. That's right. just not a big enough return for the level of risk that you took there. So I just don't like the way it works. In the <coughs> data that we track, there's about... Of all the angel group deals that get done, convertible notes are between 10 and 15 percent of the deals. So they don't—they're—they're—they're they're, they're not unheard of, but they're not the norm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I—I I think it—it's it, probably a little bit of a function of the uh, exuberance to invest in the earlier stage market, sort of driving down pricing for the the entrepreneurs. Because from a finance theory standpoint the stage the company is at, really, it should be equity in. So you end up masking it as a convertible note to, frankly, make it a little more palatable to the issuer, the, on, the entrepreneur. But from the investor's point of view, uh, it, it's, it's not as good in terms of the potential return on the security. So it's kind of a, it's a mixed bag, in my mind, in terms of why you would really want to do them in these early stage companies, unless the comp the, the, the the, the opportunity you think is just so attractive and that's the way it's priced and that's the way you have to get in. But when you're going through that, you have to ask other questions as well. So it just doesn't seem like it really fits to me. So I find, and, and this is where you, you get this real bifurcated response to convertible notes where on the IT side, there's aversion to it. And on the life sciences side, it's by far, I think, the best way to go for most early stage firms. One other thing I think in life science firms that's important is that as an angel investor, being in the Series A preferred stock is by far the best place to be because you have the class preference that protects you against 
uh, you know, a further financing event that's very negative to common. It's often in a life science in the cycle of a life sciences firm, you're very likely over three or four funding cycles to have one funding cycle where you have some bad data or you have a clinical hiccup or you have a manufacturing problem. It's rarely a straight line up on sales. It's all development ups and downs. And if you have to do a financing during one of those downs and you're in common, you're going to get killed. If you're in preferred, you have the ability to protect yourself by investing more, and you generally have the preference of class. So it's sort of the convertible note is the only way to get into preferred for most life sciences deals, I think. Yeah, in life sciences, that may be. In the deals that most angel deals are doing preferred share deals. Not in life sciences. You can't get into the preferred as an angel in life sciences huh. unless you do a convertible note. Because angels don't get to participate in a $20 million venture financing generally. Sure, right. Now, but, more but when you, you do the angel round, you can just do it as a preferred class of stock. Yeah. That's the way we mostly see it. But yeah. then the only way you can get a Series A, I love discussion, it's the only way you can get a Series A deal done yeah. is if that gets if that gets sub, that, that, then you have a Series B class of stock. The preferences that existed in A will have to go away or you can't get the VC deal done. So it looks like common anyway. You can call it a preferred, but when you do your first venture round, they're going to wash it down to something that looks like common. But why are the, why are the, the terms deal? of the convertible note more durable to the Series A preferred than a, than a Series A preferred? Because it converts into the security created by the VCs. So they're creating a Series A tent, and you convert into that tent. If they come in and do a Series B, they'll look at the Angel Series A, and they'll force you to make that look like common. And, and, and you have to, and the, as the entrepreneur, you want to protect your angels. It's not like I'm trying to wash them down. I think the convertible note protects them to the best, like in, in our situation, the angel investors at the exit of Proteon, which we expect in the next couple of months, are going to get the best return out of the whole company. Yeah. They're doing better than the venture capitalists because they got their mm -hmm. dividends and their, pref and their discounts, and they never got subjected to a common washdown. But, but I know it's totally different in IT. And so that's one of the things I think when you talk about convertible notes, you really have to make that distinction. Have you, got, have you found in your uh, data a difference in geography plays on whether it converts or prevalent or not? You know, I haven't, I haven't seen that. I should look closer at that, though. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, the convertible notes became really popular, you know, when we talked about producing a lot of new ventures that are in the funding mm -hmm. world, Techstars, Y Combinator, et cetera. They just use convertible notes because it's the only way to quickly fly through the volume of deals that they're doing. That's why I see it as somewhat lazy. It's just a matter of speed. And so once that became chic, it's, you started to see the adoption of the convertible notes go off more. But they have very tight terms on them. Entrepreneurs perceive them as very entrepreneur-friendly. They aren't always very entrepreneur-friendly. Sometimes they're very entrepreneur-unfriendly. But because it's a convertible note, uh, they make a mistake and, and view it as to their advantage. What are some of those... Low Unfair caps, bells big and discounts, forced conversion, right? Uh, forced participation and liquidation preferences of future rounds. So you know you sold a liquidation preference for you know a couple hundred thousand dollars. So you know there's there's a, the devil's in the details. Not all convertible notes are created equal for sure. I agree with that. And in life sciences, if if you want to get a convertible life science venture capitalists don't like convertible note deals because they don't like to sit, share the Series A terms and the Series A preferences with angels. So they don't like that. When we did our Series A, the first thing they said is, these convertible notes are going to have to get converted to common. These people all know, need to go to common at evaluation, we said. And we said, we're not, I mean, that ends the discussion right here, and they went away. And then they came back and said, fine, we'll let them convert into Series A, but they don't get their dividends and discounts. And we said, OK, that ends the conversation. And then they came back to us and said, OK, we'll give them the dividend, but not the discount. And we said, look, how many times are we going to have to say? It's a modest dividend. It's a modest discount. They have to have some acknowledgment of early stage risk. And finally, they said, OK, we'll take it out of your pre-money, dollar for dollar. We'll take it out of your founder piece. That hurt. So then you go, fine. Take it out of my founder piece. It's, you know, just to get the conversion done and for us to be able to get the angels what we had promised. So we took it out of the pre-money. And they said, look, if you're willing to you know, fall on your sword for them, fine you know, let's do the deal. Um, so in that regard, I think one of the things people in 
people don't think about as much is what do you do when you get to the end of the convertible note term and you haven't converted? Right. And you know, we set a three-year convertible note period and then didn't have a very good provision for what to do afterward. And luckily, we converted it two and a half years. But that's an issue, I think, for a lot of convertible notes, right? As you have a, a bunch of them maturing, what do you do afterward? No doubt. Well, that's structure. And you, I mean, the one that, one that I think of that we did that had that, it, if it didn't convert, we, we get the, effectively, as a debt holder, get the IP. So, I mean, you end up with the company, and that's why it's not very. But I think it kind of, all these questions go to whether you're the issuer, i.e., the entrepreneur, or you're the investor. And in, in my own experience, even in larger companies, I mean, we always did hybrid securities, not common, not debt, um, to, to basically lower our, 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 our cost of financing. So from the in, investor's point of view, you have to recognize that as well, that in going into convertible notes, you're basically going into something that might not have as good of a rate of return to what, what you described about the angel investors in, in Proteon. So it, it just depends on which side of the, co the table you're on. I think they're, they're more price friendly uh, for the uh, issuer, for the entrepreneur. So it's a better deal for them. But as an investor, it's, it's a worse deal for you. So. In IT. Uh, That's what I, I say. I In IT. I don't think it's a, I think well, it's a I better deal for life sciences folks. The first thing you can do as an entrepreneur to protect the angels is to make a lot of progress with the angel money which is to be very capital efficient and, and make a lot of progress. That solves a lot of problems. Really, you know, if your deal is worth more a year, a year and a half later, that's the biggest, the strongest tent you can build. Absent that, it's a negotiation. And, you know, you have to be a pretty strong negotiator and willing to walk away. And I luckily have a, a co-founder who's done, a, you know, 500, 1,000 deals, and he's got a good poker face and doesn't mind just saying, okay, walk you know walk out that door and if they come back you know then you can have another discussion it took it was it made me more nervous to do that than it made him more nervous because he had done it more times but it worked um but at the end of the day if they had not come back to us <coughs> would i have gone to the angel investors and said you know what we can't do the deal we promised you and therefore we're taking this haircut as founders and and they're asking you to take this haircut in a sense terms you expected to get you're not going to get and then for us it would have been a vote of the angels and if the majority of them would have wanted to proceed under the best terms we could get i don't think that would have been a bad thing it would have been better than just stopping right you know and then you think is is a deal not as good as you had hoped better than no deal at all you know that's where you want to invest in a good entrepreneur who can make a good judgment about that but we just didn't want to go back and have that conversation with the angels. And the amount of money we were talking about, it seemed to, to our Series A guys more ideological, like ideology or religion. We do not let the angels do this, no matter how small it was. And I felt like that was just being stubborn and that they should be accommodative. And the way they did it is say, okay, you accommodate. So, But I think maybe there's less of that rigidity now because we've all gotten our head bashed in the last five years and I think everybody's it, more flexible. I think in the life science space, the capital intensity has held more power in the venture, the larger investment rounds. Whereas outside the life science space, their power has declined significantly because you can move the ball a lot further down the field without them now. So the ability to walk is just significantly stronger than it used to be. So with angel and investor groups syndicating, etc., you know, I can farm together a couple million dollars without the VCs, and as a result, they've become much easier to work with. Mm. But at the end of the day, I mean, you have all probably heard the golden rule, right? He who has the gold makes the rules. So if your company hasn't progressed, you're going to get harsher terms. Whether they're convertible notes or preferred shares are common, it really does come down to you. You can't really paper your way through a bad deal. It is difficult. I think it's difficult everywhere. I think it's especially difficult in Kansas City in the Midwest. I think there's some reasons for the uh, difficulty that are not always, um, you know, uh, um, popular to talk about. I think we're too nice here in the Midwest. I think there are too many people that confuse activity for progress and they look at a good PowerPoint as the opportunity to be able to say, I've got a functioning product. And so I think there's a lot of clutter. 
first of all, in the Midwest, and there's not a lot of people that are willing to tell somebody that their product isn't going to work, it doesn't solve a problem. There's not a definable threshold of pain that has an economic value, and I think there's too much um, niceness. And again, I like nice, but you go out to Boston, New York, the Valley, and they're going to just laugh you out of a room. I think it's the first problem. So I think the sheer number of deals early stage, and that's where we exist, and uh, I think the fatigue that people have in looking at these deals that should never have even gotten an audience um, is one of the problems. I think another problem is that you've got, um, you know, in certain areas of the country, Kansas City being one of them, we don't have a long history in certain areas that are now developing. Um, I think Kansas City's gotten radically better in the last three to five years. But technology is not a foreign uh, object or as foreign if you go look at the Bay Area. And if you were to um, approach some folks here 10 years ago in Kansas City or St. Louis or perhaps Des Moines or Lincoln or Omaha, and if it had the word technology, God forbid you put the word social on it. And by the way, I'm not a real big fan of Angry Birds, you know, 17.0. I don't, we don't invest in companies like that. But you could chase uh, some people around a, a room uh, with a stick with a PPM that had uh, technology attached to it. So I think if you look at the... Um, background ge geographically of how people have earned their money, what they understand, their domain expertise, the basis for their reasoning, and the absence of P over E in early stage investing. There is no E, uh, unless it's entrepreneur. And uh, I think that is a real problem here in the Midwest. So I think it has compounded the dearth of capital that is here. But I think it's getting better. But I do think, um, I think the Midwest raising early stage investments is very hard. Let's see. We've raised up in two companies more than $100 million in Kansas City. And people like to say, you know, you can raise money being in Kansas City. I know Lisa talks about that a lot. And I agree with that to some extent. But my experience has been that a Kansas City company has to be 50% better generally than a Boston or San Francisco company in life sciences. 50% better, meaning 50% farther, 50% better qualifications of the team, a perfectly polished PowerPoint with all the major points on that. It has to be tight and good to get the same level of attention as an MIT spin out from Bob Langer. And I had personal experience with this. I started Proteon right around the same time Bob Langer, who's a very prolific life science entrepreneur at MIT, spun out Pervasus, which was a dog of a company. And I saw their slide decks and my slide decks, and we presented at the same place, and I kept to myself the idea of surely they're not going to get a deal before we get a deal. And they got a $20 million Series A, and one of the people I thought would do our Series A, I called him afterward and I said, you know, Bijan, why did you do Pervasus? You know Proteon's a better company. He goes, I know, but it's a Langer spin out. Polaris likes Langer. We wanted to be in on it. You know, nobody's going to criticize me for doing a Bob Langer spin out with Polaris. But you, you know, who are you? Nobody knows who you are. And, you know, and you just take that essentially as honest advice and say, I'll try harder next time. Um, so I feel like part of the tax I pay to live in Kansas City, where I'm from and I like, is that I just have to be better than the average Boston or San Francisco firm. And one thing that you guys in this room do that's very helpful for me is the academics published a study, a very nice study, that looked at the how close the returns in big firms and how geographically close the firm was that the investment. And the farther the f investment was geographically away from the investor, the better the return by a substantial amount. Now, maybe that would argue that being farther away from your venture capitalist is a good thing. But, but you know, they tried to explain that in some way and couldn't really. And part of it, they said, was, well, the threshold is higher. If I'm going to invest in a company in Omaha or, you know, or Kansas City, that company just has to reach a threshold that a Boston or San Francisco company doesn't have to reach because it's harder for me to invest there. You do what you're comfortable <clears throat> doing, and I just don't think that versus the coasts, there are as many people here because they maybe necessarily have not invested the way that the folks in the coasts have invested and even grown companies and, and been experienced with venture capital in terms of taking it and then turning around and becoming VCs or angels themselves. And I think that's a part of it here in terms of what makes it more difficult for uh, earlier stage capital in this. And, and I don't really know what we can necessarily do about that mm -hmm. per se, other than I think the best thing we can do, I, I guess I'll answer my question, is to grow 
great companies that have had venture backing where the entrepreneur becomes successful and wealthy and can then go about putting money back into the companies, into the ecosystem. That's really the best thing we can do. And I think we need to do more of that. Angel capital is an unfortunate term. I don't know if entrepreneurial capital is better because entrepreneurial is a too long of a word. But the system that I see normally happening in different cities, especially outside the Bay and Boston and such, is that you get a cashed out entrepreneur who's made a lot of money uh, doing entrepreneurship. So they actually believe that this can work. They know how it works. Then that, that capital begins to recycle within that geography. Mm -hmm. So in Portland, Oregon, we've seen over the last, say, 10 years, uh, an improvement on this front because we've had two or three nice exits. And then that exit money starts to churn within that local economy. So in the earliest stages, that's vital in terms of getting the stuff to go. And I don't know that there's really any way to fake that or jump start that. It's just a difficult road to hoe. Uh, that's one big thing. And then I thought I'd just add two other, two other points on the geography side of this. Uh, one is returns related. In the angel investment return day that I track, I looked at urban versus rural re rates of return between deals, no difference. So, on our, and, and similarly, if you look at venture capital return by state to your threshold point, there's really not a lot of return differences that are geographic. It's mostly activity stuff that's different geographically. Mm -hmm. So it isn't that you can't do it. I do think the threshold's higher. And then I think that there's this sort of natural time lag between freed up entrepreneurial capital, and then the next round of ventures that get funded by those cashed out entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would add one thing to that, uh, since I'm here with Peter, is that in Kansas City, historically, we have not seen those cashed out entrepreneurs come back in as active investors. And you're a really great example of someone who did that, someone who was very successful and had the ability to do you know, riskier investments and was willing to take that risk. I see in Kansas City large pools of capital that go, you know, to big firm, wealth management firms that get globally diversified. Because, you know, you, you stick your neck out. You, you know, Grassmere makes a local investment in a high risk, potentially high re return investment. You sort of put a little bit of your pride, a little bit of your reputation on the table. And a lot of entrepreneurs in this region, being more conservative, haven't been willing to do that as much. And I do see that as a difference between the coasts and here, is that recycling of capital. We haven't done that. Now, this Kauffman Foundation is a wonderful recycling of capital. Yeah, yeah. that's a great example. Where we are. Where we yeah, are. That's what I was going to say. Is, you know, it doesn't have a fund associated with it, but it, it was a form of recycling. I'd add a last one comment. I do agree. I think uh, it's always interesting. Um, when I go out of town, I seem to gain 20 IQ points, and I could use it more than most. Um, but if you're from out of town, you're just, you're just apparently better. Um, but I think it's also a function in the Midwest of density. There's interesting, there was a conversation that we had recently uh, with the Zappos guys, and Tony Shea's got a very interesting term. It's called collisions per square foot per hour. <laughs> and the idea of density is a function of people that are trying to get things done or move the ball forward, or if I can bump into somebody in a coffee shop or at the gas pump or at a conference like this to where we share one piece of information, and it's continuous advancement, validation, and it's just a you know, shorter cycle time. So I think also the density within a geography is going to be very important to be able to get early stage deals done because it's always about probably more, you know, more decisions, more frequent that are less critical, but man, the cycle time needs to shorten. And if I could add one little thing to that, I think that's really important. And one little advantage we're getting with the technology that exists today is when we're spread out, we can still collide in ways we couldn't 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you had to get on a plane. Mm. So an example for me is when I started Proteon, I still had an adjunct faculty position at Hopkins. And right around the time I got that position, Hopkins implemented for its faculty the ability to digitally request anything from their library. And they would send some, if it wasn't digital, they'd send someone into the stacks and photocopy it. And they had a limit of 10 papers per day. And every day I sent a request for 10. And after a while, someone called me up and they're like, who are you? <laughs> right? Who are you? You're in Kansas City. When is this going to stop, basically? <laughs> And, I, and, and they cut me to five because I was some <laughs> high user. And then every day I sent in five. And they, were, you know, and they charged me a nominal fee. And that, I didn't have to be in the Hopkins library like to have the collisions. And I felt like that was a, a bit of, a, of a, you know, a narrowing of the gap between us and, say, Boston or Baltimore. 
This is great discussion. Um, are there certain types of companies that, uh, sticking with geography for one more question, certain types of companies or even situations that are easier to finance here in this region um, versus others? And or the other part of the question is, what's really tough? Herb, you talked a little bit about you know, four or five years ago the word technology was toxic. Um, sounds like less so now. What, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I can only speak to what we do. Um, we, 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 have a, we have a little bit different matrix than some, but probably not as good as most. Um, we start with the idea. The idea we follow um, both, you know, certain milestones, the, the easy question, better, faster, cheaper, easier. Um, then we follow themes, you know, you know, themes like, you know, we sold some Mary Meeker, by the way, um, but we liked what, what she had to say about Internet of Things, you know, the uh, sharing economy. You know, we, we, the majority of what we build and invest in are things that don't go on a shelf, although as soon as I say that, we do have things that do go on a shelf now. But, um, you know, we're, we're talking about software type of things. But then we look at the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur, and when we look at things that we fund, it always goes back to the entrepreneur. Early stage, you guys have heard this a million times, it's less about the idea, it's more about the entrepreneur. We run some very unique um, behavioral tests, I'll say. Uh, it's not to sound like it's gamesmanship, but they're very real, and we do pay a lot of attention to creating artificial, stressful situations to see people all react. We uh, run a thing uh, called a modified Hogan assessment, which actually looks for risk assessment based on strong personality traits and under stress. Uh, a very strong personality can actually be a derailer. And then we run a couple other traps too. And then we go back to the investment themes. And then it's also about bolting on ROI. But really, we, we're very broad in our scope, but very specific when we find it. And so I, I couldn't tell you, I know that Kansas City financial technology, information technology, healthcare technology, I, I can't speak to life sciences. We've got a great history here too, but those seem to be three prevalent theme, themes, at least in Kansas City, that more people are reacting to favorably today than ever. I look at the at the the question. I think inherently is less geographic and more personal. In the in Kansas City, and I'm not from here, so I don't know the details. There are people for which deal A is perfect, and deal B is a horrible investment, and vice versa. So I I don't look at opportunity for an investment or for an entrepreneur even as independent of the person doing the investing. Uh, so I think it's less about Kansas City and more about whether you're doing a deal with John or Susie. And Susie might be perfect for this deal, and John might be perfect for that deal, because their Rolodex is different, their expertise historically is different, and I just don't think that Kansas City is perhaps the right unit of analysis there. I think it's much more personal than that. So in the city of Portland, you'll have people who are right for one and not another. And in the city of St. Louis, or you know, pick your city, there's a mix of people that can be the right fit for the right kind of deal, as opposed to looking at the city as the as the platform. You see, so you're saying it's reliant on the personalities that exist in that and, and, and their expertise. So yeah. in the in the day that I track, a huge factor on reducing failed investments for angel investors is investing near your expertise, right? Which isn't rocket science, but it's an important reminder that when you know a lot about an industry, you just have better intuition, better <laughs> analytics, better relationships to avoid backing non-starters, <laughs> and uh, that that's a much more one-to-one -one kind of matching thing than a region-to-one kind of matching thing. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, deal, the, the, the deals that are produced, I think, are a bit of a function of the industry expertise and successes that have occurred in an area. So, for example, a town not too far from here has had a lot of success in, in the restaurant industry. So there are just a whole bunch of people in that. They do a lot of restaurant deals down there because people have had success in that industry. So. Um, here, my, my point of view is, I mean, I'm a consumer guy inherently, and uh, I've been frustrated in the lack of consumer deals. I mean, a lot of medical, healthcare, biotech, a lot of technology, but not a lot of consumer. But I can answer my own question because there's not a lot of consumer stuff mm -hmm. that's grown in great success here in, in, in Kansas City. And yeah. I suspect that's kind of the way it goes in other cities around the country. It's what people have been successful doing there sort of gives birth to those types of opportunities and people more comfortable in investing in those types right. of opportunities. Exactly. Well, look, I had extremely high hopes and expectations for this panel and, and uh, they were exceeded. So this has been a great dialogue. Said that. <laughs> Thank you. Guys.